Uh, welcome to the Jigyasa Vigyan Mahotsav that is being celebrated uh, by CSIR. So all the uh, students uh, might be uh, uh, having experience in Jigyasa Vigyan Mahotsav under different boot camps that are being uh, conducted by CSIR. So welcome you all to the uh, next boot camp. This is the fourth one of the series on agrotechnology. So uh, to begin with, I would request uh, uh, our director, uh, Dr. Srinivas Reddy, uh, to uh, give his uh, uh, inaugural uh, introductory remarks. So today we have with us uh, the eminent speaker, uh, Dr. E.V.S. Prakasa Rao, who will be uh, giving the expert talk today for the students and will be interacting with the students. And we also have with us uh, director, Institute of Himalayan Bioresource Technology, IHBT Palampur with us, who will be, uh, who is known figure in the field of uh, 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 agronomy and agriculture. So he has done a lot of uh, work in the area of uh, agriculture sciences, and he will also be uh, giving insights on how this agrotechnology can take us forward in this era. So uh, to begin with, I would request Dr. Reddy uh, to give his introductory remarks, please. Thank you, Asha. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, all. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director, CSIR IHBT Palampur, Himachal Pradesh. Dr. E.V.S. Prakash Rao, Honorary Scientist, CSIR 4PI Bengaluru. And many scientists uh, joined from uh, uh, from different uh, organizations, particularly CSIR labs, and uh, dear students. So we welcome you all for this uh, interesting session and today's uh, proceedings. Of course, you're already part of this uh, boot camps of uh, other domains. And as you all know, India is celebrating 75 years of independence as Ajadika Amrut Mahatsav so across this country. As part of uh, celebrations, Ministry of Science and Technology uh, is conducting this uh, Amrut Mahasa showcase, this uh, roadmap to 2047. So as you are aware, probably it is already discussed and also our uh, colleagues also going to discuss a little bit more details. But as, uh, as we all know that uh, CSIR, particularly this our organization, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, are organizing national level scientific uh, creativity competition called Jigyasa Vigyan Mahotsav 2022 for the school students. So this competition is to provide opportunity for the school children to exhibit their creative skills and also to develop uh, their scientific knowledge. Of course, uh, these are all uh, done in different areas like uh, energy, health, AI, that is artificial intelligence, climate change, water conservation, agrotechnology, and uh, disaster uh, mitigations. And uh, again, CSR will facilitate uh, students by providing awareness about this uh, subject, of course, by inviting uh, experts in this domain, different domains. Like as you can see today, also we have. Uh, uh, Dr. Prakash Rao, his expert, is going to give more details and uh, conduct these boot, ca boot camps in form of lectures, workshops, and also from different ways they are trying to uh, engage you all, the students. So you can approach uh, any of these, our uh, CSR labs spread across India from south to north, east to west. We have about, uh, several laboratories in different domains. So during these competitions and students have opportunity to compete the national level that is important and uh, also win attractive prizes. And uh, you can visit, uh, there is a Jignasa virtual portal, lab portal. So there, there you can get time to time updates and uh, details about uh, these programs and competitions. You can get uh, more details. You can keep visiting that place. I'm confident that uh, you are going to all going to get benefit from this uh, Jignasa programs. I wish you all the best. So now I request uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director IHBT. He's an expert in this, uh, particularly for today's uh, topics domain. And I request uh, 
Dr. Sanjay Kumar to make a few comments before we go to Dr. Prakash Rao's lecture. Sir, welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, sir. Uh, very good afternoon, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Prakash Rao, all the scientists who are joined through this Zoom platform and all the students who are associated with us and all our guests. So very good afternoon once again. And I am so happy that uh, IIIM is organizing this important program on agrotechnology. You know, when we talk of CSIR and agrotechnology, CSIR has got its USP, its unique selling feature, unique selling point. We are different from, although if you talk of agriculture, agrotechnology, immediately, you know, ICR comes to our mind. But there are certain unique things in CSIR which are not there in ICR. Although students must remember that there was a time immediately after independence when there was a situation known as ship to mouth. We had no food grains in our country and we were dependent on Western countries, particularly USA, to even for the things like wheat. And today we have reached self-sufficiency in the area of wheat. But wheat is just one part of agriculture. There are several important issues in agriculture. And one of the important issues that CSIR is focusing upon, which can enhance the livelihood of our farmers and of our people. When Honorable Prime Minister says that we have to enhance the income of the farmers, what are the ways to enhance the income of the farmers? One way is to give them the crop which is more lucrative. And the crop area where one is looking. For example, if you talk of Jammu Kashmir, if you talk of Himachal Pradesh, these areas may not be very suitable for growing the convention crops like wheat and rice. If rice is to be grown, let it be special right rice, for example, red rice or black rice. These areas are very suitable for growing aromatic crops, which gives you aroma. These are very suitable areas, which gives you for cultivation of floriculture crops. These are the areas which are very suitable for cultivation of medicinal plants. And in today's scenario, for example, if you are in a situation of importing say 40 tons of uh, rose oil, for example, from Turkey and other countries, India is such a vast land, why India can't grow? And it's not only rose oil, but you take any oil, you take lavender oil, you take tejetus oil, you know, at one time we used to import 12 tons of tejetus oil per year from South Africa. Why? Why can't we grow? So here unique things and what we did over a period of time that today we are, when we say we are world leader in things like mentha oil, for example, why it happened and how it happened, we should understand it. We realize that we need the right variety. You know, whenever you talk of agriculture, first fundamental requirement is to have the right variety. And that's what CSR did over a period of time for aromatic plants, for medicinal plant, for floriculture, they developed the right variety. That is one major contribution of CSR. And after developing that variety, then we develop the quantity. Suppose you develop a variety, and if you do not have the right quantity of that particular variety, how it will be beneficial for the people, for our farmers? That we should see. So quality, quantity, these two aspects we develop for aromatic plants, for like, for example, rose, mentha, uh, rose, then your lavender, even mentha, which comes both aromatic plants as well as uh, medicinal plant, German chamomile, so there are lemongrass. So there are series of such plant species you will see India has developed. And these plants can give you remuneration moment you attach the processing technology. So that is second thing that we have done. We have not developed only the varieties, but also developed the processing technologies for which we develop the appropriate infrastructure. For example, if you develop, if you grow a rose plant, then at the same time, you give them distillation units so that 
and you teach farmers how to do distillation so that farmers can develop and they can produce oil of the crop that they are growing and then you link them with the market and today for example jammu is world leader now in lavender production right? it's known as uh, purple revolution in himachal ilbt did golden revolution through tejetus minute oil cmap has already done mentha revolution right? today we are world leader in mentha oil production so these are some of the successful examples similarly you know we have integrated now to enhance further farmers income we have integrated honey production along with this aromatic crop and floriculture crop floriculture has enhanced income by 3 to 5 times compared to the traditional crops so what our honorable prime minister is insisting that we should enhance the farmers income i think these are some of the ways right and then we are introducing the relevant crops for example uh, in northeast area people never grew apples and once we started doing apples you can see the chief minister recognized it honorable pm recognized it right and that enhanced the farmers income we introduce crop like asafoetida for which we are totally dependent or hing what we call it india never used to grow hing or asafoetida in this country all we used to import from afghanistan and other areas cinnamon we import totally more than 45000 tons from outside why can't india grow so we csr is doing all sorts of crop saffron you know for which only about 10 tons we grow in kashmir and 100 tons we import from other countries whereas you have areas in himachal pradesh and uttarakhand where you can grow these crops right so that's where the csr comes and pitches into it identifies the right crop it identifies the right varieties it gives it to the farmers teaches them how to process it and links with the market that's our role i am sure that dr prakash rao in his presentation he will cover all these things in detail so just in very brief i just wanted to sensitize all our uh, students that when csir works it works right from end to end from development of variety to the market that's where we work we work on crops which can give them higher income per unit area that's what we work upon and that is our usp for which icr also recognizes actually we work very closely with organization like icr and so that we can work together on several issues of common interest because icr is world leader when we talk of varieties and to tomorrow if you have to register our varieties if you have to introduce any plant species icr comes to our help and icr has been so helpful i must tell you at various places whenever we worked on such crops icr just came and worked together on introduction on varietal release on what we are looking for even the state government works very closely with csi and for which you all are so grateful so with this very small introductory remark uh, i must tell that agriculture has a very bright future and what csi does it really helps a lot in enhancing the farmers income their quality of life through Uh, whether aromatic crops glory god that dr prakash rao has so many things to share uh, with you the on the um, you know what csr is doing and how it is going ahead so uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and sharing some of our views on what we are doing in csir in the area of agrotech thank you so much thank you so much sir for uh, giving these students insight about the subject uh i hope uh, students will uh, be uh, benefited from the uh, expert lecture today so before we enter into the lecture let me uh, although you some of you might uh, have been registered for other uh, domains also so you might have experienced how what are the rules for this uh, vigyan mahotsav and competition but uh, uh, let me uh, Uh, in, introduce you about the uh, salient features which will be required and you have to follow to be uh, in the competition so i'll just share my screen and uh, briefly i'll let you know the uh, how you can be part of this competition 
So I hope the students can see my uh, slides. So uh, as uh, Dr. Reddy and uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, both of them has said that we are uh, at CSIR uh, celebrating Jigya, uh, Jigyasa Vigyan Mahotsa and students are invited to submit their entries in uh, various uh, forms like uh, comics, science fiction, infographics, videos, app development, and animation, etc. in various domains. So uh, the domains uh, which have already been covered so far are disaster mitigation, health, and energy. So today we are discussing about agrotechnology, which is uh, one of the important area of uh, a, where India um, India can grow and we can be the uh, self-reliant in terms of agriculture. So uh, moving to the next slide. So uh, as a part of Amrit Mahotsav, a science showcase, we are uh, organizing this event. And this will provide you all to exhibit your creative skills and develop your scientific knowledge through the boot camps that are being organized. Uh, so we are trying to, uh, uh, to make you aware about the subject as well as how you can create the content and show your uh, skills, creativity. And uh, the, uh, the, the winners of the competition uh, they, their virtual content will be uh, the part of Jigyasa uh, virtual lab. So it will get the global outreach. So uh, as I already said, uh, various themes that we will be discussing are energy, health, artificial intelligence, disaster mitigation, water conservation, climate change, and agrotechnology. So you can develop the contents like videos, app development, animations, infographics, uh, then uh, comic development and uh, so on. So you can use Hindi as well as English as your uh, language for uh, submitting your content. So uh, what kind of content we are looking at? We would like to have the, uh, we expect you to identify the various issues in various domains. And what are the challenges being faced uh, by the uh, population, the Indian population? And how can you create the awareness and identify the solutions to face these challenges? And how can you think of uh, providing the solutions uh, by, by your uh, vision? So uh, your content will be evaluated on the basis of the creativity, innovative idea how can you tell the story so so your storytelling ability how you convey your message what you want to convey to uh, the uh, to the society what are the aesthetic sense of the content out of box thinking and usability or applicability of the content that you develop during the competition so the terms and conditions that uh, have you have to follow are so anybody can register to participate in the competition so it is free of cost you there is no uh, fee for uh, the for participation so a student can apply uh, on a, as an individual or as a team so your team may be uh, two to five individuals so you can submit your content as an individual as well as as a team. So just in case a team wins a, wins the competition, so the prize will be distributed uh, among the uh, students. So we will be giving uh, uh, prizes or you will be evaluated as a team, not as an individual. So you have to take care that in mind. So anybody who can be part of the team, but the content should be scientific. So it should have science background. So entries uh, from class 8th to class 12th are invited to compete in the competition. And you can choose any of the medium, maybe English or Hindi for uh, this. So any of the domain you can pick for uh, developing your content. And your presentation of data should be accurate and clear. 
it should not be copied from anywhere else so entries uh, that uh, that contain the copyright artwork will be rejected so please don't do that avoid any controversial topics which uh, may lead to any controversy please don't pick those uh, topics rather you choose the interesting and uh, uh, the topics which uh, which have more challenges and you can provide solutions to that so as uh, i previously said so a competition will uh, in the first boot camp you will uh, we will be uh, uh, getting awareness about the uh, themes and in once you uh, uh, to attend the uh, the boot camp one at the end of the session after the expert talk you will have the quiz competition and the students who will qualify the uh, quiz will uh, get the participation certificate and they can enter into the boot camp 2 so in the boot camp 2 so we will be holding few workshops where uh, you will be able to interact with the uh, uh, scientists and other experts and they will uh, may, uh, tell you how you can develop your virtual content and uh, those sessions will be held after the boot camp one session will be over and uh, you will be getting certificates e certificates for participation in boot camp one as well as in boot camp two so boot camp two will be held from 17th to 21st january so these are the dates and timings where different uh, boot camps uh, will be uh, held so uh, first boot camp will be over by uh, 14th of january so this is the fourth boot boot camp and hereafter three more boot camps will be uh, held uh, by siri pilani ncl and iitr so today uh, we'll uh, have the uh, eminent speaker dr evs prakasa rao who will be talking about the smart agriculture and uh, uh, will uh, listen to him carefully because the quiz that we have designed is based on his talk so i I'll, i'll request all the students to be uh, vigilant during the uh, uh, the lecture so that you can uh, pass the quiz uh, easily so this this is the uh, csr jigyasa channel where you are watching uh, the uh, live streaming of this boot camp so here in this uh, uh, jigyasa channel you have we have several uh, uh, videos where you can uh, follow uh, whatever is happening in csr and what are the virtual uh, csr virtual lab uh, you can follow here and various virtual contents are available here whenever you get chance to visit this site you can visit there and watch the scientific content so uh, here uh, you can uh, you can uh, learn how can you develop the games comics simulations infographics or videos etc so these kind of contents are available at uh, jigyasa channel you can do that and uh, i would request all the students to kindly register for the competition because you can attend the boot camps you can get the certificates but to compete in the uh, in the uh, competition to submit your content you have to register so please please those who have not registered please register yourselves and i would request uh, before you enter into the quiz please kindly uh, register yourselves so that uh, you can uh, get most of the benefit that is uh, being planned by csir so you can follow us on twitter facebook and youtube and uh, hereafter i would uh, uh, close my presentation i hope all the students now know how they can uh, participate in the competition uh, may i now uh, let us move on to the expert talk and i would request dr uh, shrinivas reddy director csr triple m to introduce the speaker to the audience please thank you thank you dr asha it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker dr evs prakash rao he is a honorary scientist at present at uh, csir 4pi that is also called fourth paradigm institute earlier it used to be called 
Center for Mathematical Modeling and Compu Computer Simulation in Bangalore. Before that, uh, he was uh, heading uh, research center at Bangalore of uh, CMAP, that is Center uh, Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants, CMAP. Of course, the main branch is in Lucknow, but there is a center there. And he was also chief scientist and advisor at uh, CSIR 4PI Bangalore before uh, before he took up this particular position now. So, uh, Dr. EVS Prakash Rao got his education, early education, particularly BSc in agriculture in 1973 from AP Agriculture University, Hyderabad. Then MSc in agronomy in 1976 and PhD in agronomy in uh, 1980. So both are from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, IARI, New Delhi. And he has vast experience and he published uh, close to 150 papers in international and Indian journals and uh, several books and presented about 130 conference papers and delivered 93 invited lectures. And uh, he, he also has several awards and honors, but just to name few for the benefit of students, and he was uh, elected fellow of uh, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, India, elected fellow of Indian Society of Agronomy, elected fellow of Indian Society of Spices. And uh, he has many other things also, like gold medal in Indian Society of uh, Agronomy and a few other things. I'm not going to go through the details. So instead, we listen more from uh, his uh, experience and uh, and I, again, as Dr. Asha said, so you people have to listen carefully. And uh, based on his lecture, there will be some questions and other things. You can participate more into programs. With this, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Prakash Rao, sir, uh, please uh, take over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srinivas Reddy, respected Dr. Srinivas Reddy, Director Kiplayam Jammu. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director of IHBT Palampur, and other colleagues from CSA are here uh, who are in the organizing uh, team. So I'm very grateful to IIIM, especially Director and Asha, Dr. Asha Chobe for kindly inviting me to participate in this very important program because this is very important to me because it is uh, sensitizing young minds, bright minds, into different areas of science and technology. So I have got a chance to motivate or ignite some thoughts in the minds of youngsters on this particular subject today. What we are going to discuss is agrotechnology. Young friends, Today is an opportunity for all of us to dwell upon the most important sector in our country, especially India, that is agriculture or agrotechnology. So agriculture forms the basis for the livelihood. It forms the basis for the whole economy and it forms the basis for this political stability and strategic advantage as we are seeing in the world today. To give you just an example that India is now going to give nearly 1 lakh tons of metric tons of wheat to troubled country like Afghanistan. So not only India is able to feed its 1.3 plus billion population, it is also helping other countries in the area of food. So this has all been possible because of the advances that the science, advances that the technology, advances that the policy has made in the field of agriculture, and especially the agrotechnology has been the backbone for what we are seeing today, what that Sanjay Kumar has mentioned in his opening remarks, that India has grown 
from ship to mouth to a position where we are able to export food now. Friends, it is very important for us to know that there are many scientists, there are many technologists all over the country who are working to enhance agro-technology in our country. Dr. Sanjay Kumar has already mentioned that ICR has been working on agriculture, but CSAR works on some niche areas of agro-technology, which enhances the value of crops, livelihoods, and environment. So the contributions made by CSAR in the field of agriculture has been very briefly given by Dr. Sanjay Kumar, which I think covers in a nutshell of what CSAR has been contributing in this very important area. But today, now, in the lecture I'll give you, because you are school students, I'll give you a brief overview of what agrotechnology is all about so far. And what is agrotechnology, what we are looking ahead in this generation and the next generation. You are able to see my screen now? Yes, sir, we can see. So, in this very important uh, program yes. of the CSAR, yes, yes, yes uh, Dr. Asha, please. You need to share your uh, PPT. It is not visible? It, it is not visible to me, at least. That's how it is only on the house side we are yeah. able to see. On the left hand side, we are able to see. Uh, yes, yes, now it is, that okay. is fine. Yes, yes now, it is now, okay. now you are able to see. Yes, yes, yes fine. now it is fine. Thank you, Ratsa. Thank you. So, as you all know, that CSR has been one of the most proactive organizations in the country to enthuse young, young students in the area of science and technology. Jigyasa Vigyan Mahotsav 2022 is one such program where the students are exposed to different areas of science and technology, which Dr. Asha has already given you a list of. So today we will be talking about agrotechnology for food production. As I have already mentioned, that agrotechnology forms the backbone of as to how we can enhance the production of food and other products from the domain of agriculture, from the domain of processing, in the domain of value addition. So let us just have a look at, for those students who are not very familiar, how the agriculture has originated. The man had been a hunter in the beginning, but about one lakh years back, the man started collecting wild grains for his food requirements. Then started the agriculture nearly more than 12,000 years back, 9,500 BCE the agriculture started in the world. And the agriculture has grown throughout the history, majorly in five phases. Number one, initially it was manual agriculture, where man was working himself, and then he was using the animals. 
So then in the phase two, machines have come where tractors, mechanical implements have come into the picture. The third phase was chemical agriculture where fertilizers, pesticides, such chemicals have come into the picture to enhance agricultural production. The fourth phase was the genetic improvement using land breeding technologies and biotechnologies. Man has developed superior varieties of crops to increase the food production and also the nutritional value of food crops. And recently, the fifth phase is the use of artificial intelligence. I think today you have a boot camp in the evening on the artificial intelligence separately. But here we are talking about artificial intelligence in agrotechnology, where robots, satellites, and data analytics are extensively used. Actually, if you ask me, what is agrotechnology? Agrotechnology constitutes the use of technologies such as mechanical, chemical technologies, biological technologies, space technologies, information technologies, artificial intelligence, and others for growing crops. So when you say crops, there are different types of crops. The various groups of crops are like cereals. For example, rice, wheat, maize. These are some of the examples of cereals. They provide carbohydrates in our diet. The second one is pulses. For example, black gram, green gram, moong dal, red gram, arhar. They provide proteins in our diet. Next group is called oil seeds. For example, mustard, sarso, groundnut, till, sesame, sunflower. These crops provide fats. As you all know, that human diet requires majorly carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So these are provided by these groups of crops. Then comes fiber crops, which are used in textiles and other uses. For example, cotton, jute. Then you have cash crops where they're grown for only for cash reasons. For example, sugarcane, cotton. Then you have fodder crops, which are fodder crops means the crops which are used for feeding animals. They're called animal feeds. For example, maize, sorghum, alfalfa. Very importantly, next group of crops is called horticultural crops. You know them, vegetables, fruits, and flowers. Vegetables and fruits, they provide much needed minerals, vitamins, antioxidants, and many other beneficial nutritional elements in the human diet. And finally, next group of crops are called plantation crops. For example, you have tea, coffee. You are able to see this? Okay. Coffee, rubber, spices. So these are the groups of crops. So here, this slide summarizes the vast range of crops, which are very important in the sector of agriculture. But then recently, we have also added medicinal and aromatic plants as alternative crops, as a diversification crops, which Dr. Sanjay Kumar has already mentioned to enhance farmers' income. So there are many medicinal and aromatic plants, which I don't want to give a list of here because the subject is very vast and I'll restrict to only agrotechnologies. Now, coming to agrotechnologies. So this particular talk is divided into two parts, majorly two parts. 
Number one is about agro technologies. What are these different components of agro technologies man has been using so long? Is the first part. The second part will be the recent developments in agro technologies, which man has started using and the man is going to use in future. Coming to the agro technologies of the present, there are different technologies like land preparation, sowing or planting, menus and fertilizer application, weeds, pest control, irrigation that is giving water to the crops, cropping systems which involves crop rotations, intercropping, and finally harvesting. So now we will go one by one. All these components of agrotechnologies very briefly to give you an idea of what they mean to us. Coming to the land preparation. Land preparation means we clear the fields, and remove the weeds. So this is the first step. Then we give a pre-irrigation. And then we do the first plowing and tilling. So we can use animals. Here, tractor is used. And then we do harrowing. Harrowing is nothing but removing or breaking the big clots of earth to make the land pliable and the, a fine-tilled soil for growing crops. Then we'll add water, we'll apply water and level the fields. So this is the first part of agrotechnology. The next part is sowing and planting. So either we sow the seeds manually in the field, or we sow the seeds through the machines, sowing machines. The another one is transplanting. nursery mein plants grow kiye jate hain, aur uske dusre jagah par plant karte hain. For example, here you have a nursery in trays and they are transplanted here. And here there is a rice nursery here and they are transplanted in the main field. So this is the second part of the agrotechnology that is used in agriculture. The next important part is menus and fertilizers. Basically, menus are organic in nature. And whenever we say fertilizers, they are chemicals. So these are very much required for providing nutrients for the optimum growth and good yields of crop plants. When it comes to manures, you have different examples like we have compost, we have farm ad manure, we have poultry manure. Recently, a lot of emphasis is given on vermicompost and other organic manures. Coming to the chemical fertilizers, you have two groups of nutrients. One is major nutrients, another one is secondary and micronutrients. So major nutrients are popularly called NPK. N is nitrogen, for example, urea, ammonium sulfate. P is phosphorus, example, superphosphate. K is potassium, example, murata potash, which is chemically potassium chloride. And then comes to the next group of nutrients, which are required by the crop plants in smaller quantities. That's why they are called secondary and micronutrients. For example, secondary nutrients, zinc sulfate. And for a micronutrient, an example is iron sulfate, FeSO4. And also we have natural sources for providing nutrients to the crop plants. For example, your rock phosphate, which is in rock form and powdered and used for providing phosphorus to the plants. And then you have a plethora of soil microbes I'm not giving the details of the microbes, but there are vast array of soil microbes which are used as a source of nutrients to these crop plants. And then we have seaweeds also as source of nutrients to the crop.
crop plants. The next aspect is weeds, pests, and diseases. In the same way as human beings get diseases, human being gets nutritional problems. This is, similarly, the crop plants also suffer from competition from other plants. They are called weeds. Weeds are plants, they compete with the crops and reduce their yields. But these weeds can be controlled by hand, by mechanical methods, or by chemicals. These chemicals are called herbicides. Herbicide is a chemical which kills weeds. For example, glyphosate. Glyphosate is a very common herbicide that is used world over. The next problem that crops face is insect pests. Hindi mein isko kide kehte hain. Insect pests they cause a lot of damage to the crops. Kabhi kabhi whole crop ko nast kar dete hain ek insect pests. They are controlled by basically two methods. One is by chemicals. The chemicals that kill the insect pests are called insecticides. For example, chlorophyrephos is one important insecticide. And then we have biological agents. For example, Bt. Some of you would have heard about Bt cotton that is very common in India where from bacillus thuringiensis, a gene is transferred to the cropland, cotton in, in our country, to control the pests, insect pests. And then you have another group of biological agent called trichogramma, which is also used for controlling insect pests. Then the third group of problems come from land diseases. And these are very common threats to the crop plants. So this can create a huge loss to the crop plants depending on the several environmental factors. For example, when you have high humidity, high temperatures, the many leaf diseases, they'll come and destroy the crop plants. Like you have rice blast disease, which destroys the rice crop in such conditions. These diseases could be controlled by chemicals, which are called fung uh, fungicides. Fungicides, they control the plant diseases. For example, captophal. Captophal is a fungicide. And then we can also use biological agents to control these plant diseases. For example, trichoderma. Trichoderma is one agent which can control many plant diseases, which is very, they are wide, very widely used. So these are called biological control methods. So you have basically chemical methods of control and biological control of methods of insect pests and plant diseases. The next part of agrotechnology is irrigation because water is essential for the growth, for the optimum yields, and for enhanced quality of crops. So there are different methods of applying water. There are different methods of irrigation. Like, for example, this is a flood irrigation system where water is let into the field, something like a flood. The whole field is filled with water. But the problem with such a method is that a lot of water is wasted. Sometimes it can damage a part of the crop because of water logging. So there is generally very low efficiency of water in such methods. But traditionally it was used earlier but slowly, another method has come, which is called furrow method, where you have formed the furrows and then you let water in 
through these furrows by which you save a good amount of water. So basically, these are the two methods which have been used as an agrotechnology in our country and worldwide. But recently, micro irrigation systems have come into existence. A lot of technologies have been developed, and still, a lot of technologies are being developed now. Actually, you can have a project on this of devising nozzles, devising sprinklers of more efficiency and things like that. So here you have two kinds of micro-irrigation systems. One is sprinkler system where water is sprinkled onto the crops. And then you have drip irrigation where the water is taken through tubes and there are nozzles and then the water is dripping at the root zone of the crop plant. The advantage of these methods, especially the drip irrigation system, is that you save a lot of water and then the water use efficiency is so high that the economic returns from growing these crops under this drip irrigation would be very high. The next part of the agrotechnology is cropping systems. So in agrotechnology, we talk about cropping systems. So these broadly, they are divided into two types. One is called crop rotation. Crop rotation meaning you grow a crop, harvest it, and after that you grow another crop in the same land. For example, you grow rice, harvest it, and then you plant wheat, grow it and harvest, and then you grow pulses. The advantage of crop rotation is that you are able to derive more yields of different varieties of crops, more income from the field, from the same land in the same year. And also by including legumes like pulses, you can even enhance the soil fertility. Another system of cropping systems is intercropping systems, intercropping. Intercropping is growing two or more crops in the same land and at the same time. In crop rotation, it is not the same time, it is the same land. Whereas in intercrop, it is the same land and at the same time. So you grow two or more crops, which are of different nature. For example, here you can see in this picture, Urdal, black gram is intercropped in bananas. So banana is a tall growing plant, whereas black gram is, you know, prostrate and, you know, is not a tall growing plant. And these two do not compete for nutrients. So therefore, in the same land, you are growing two crops at the same time. And also, growing these intercrops can reduce the weeds that otherwise would grow here, thereby reducing the yields of banana. So that, so the improved cropping systems that what, what we are talking about will enhance the returns from the same land same time of the year. The finally, the agrotechnology involves harvesting. So when the crops are mature, then the crops are harvested for grains, for example, rice and wheat for grains, fodder crops for the fodder, fruits, vegetables. So these are all harvested. Basically, there are two methods of harvesting. One is manual harvesting, where implements like sickles are used manually and then they are harvested here. And also you have mechanical methods where mechanical harvesters are used for harvesting these crops. So these are the various phases of agrotechnologies that have been very traditionally used by farmers over the time. And there are improvements in this. For example, CSAR has designed a tractor called Swaraj, which was very popular and uh, helped Indian farmers very greatly. One of the very significant contributions by CSAR was the Swaraj tractors, which some of you would have heard about them. 
but uh, CSR has done excellent work in this. So now we'll go to the second part of my lecture. That is some recent developments in agro technologies. So agro technologies are not stagnant. Agro technologies are not specific in the sense that they have to be constantly used in the same way over the time, but they keep on evolving with science and technology. So there are many technologies, many developments that are taking place in this area. So now I list out a few of them, which are very important for young students like you to know and also further research on them. You can even develop your projects based on some of these ideas, what I'm going to tell you in the coming few slides. The first one is soilless cultivation, because so long man has been growing crops, plants in the soil only, but now it is possible to grow them without soil. So they are called, for example, hydroponics, aeroponics. We will see some details later, but just please note down that soilless cultivation examples are hydroponics, aeroponics. And then you have lesser land level, using lesser beams, we do leveling of land during land preparation. And we use sensors for various uses. So I'm going to list out what are the sensors in the next few slides. That is another development. The next one is we are developing machinery, specific machinery for sowing of different types of crops, different types of fertilizer application, and different kinds of harvesting. So machinery for harvesting, wheat will be different, machinery for harvesting, fruits will be different. So different machineries are being developed. That is one of the recent developments in agrotechnologies. Then comes the micro-irrigation. This we have discussed very briefly earlier, like sprinklers and drip, which is a very recent development. I wish to add here, that when we are giving drip irrigation, along with the irrigation, we can even apply, apply fertilizers also. That is called fertigation. Here I'm not written here, you can make a note of that, that fertigation is including fertilizers along with water through drips, that is called fertigation. Then comes vertical farming. So we'll see what is vertical farming. And then you have vertical farming is basically for urban areas where land is very much limited. In the coming few slides, we will go ahead and see what is all vertical farming about. Then we use drones for agronomic practices. Agronomic practices means agrotechnology practices. And we use satellites for agronomic practices. So now we'll go one by one about all these new recent developments in agrotechnologies. Coming to soilless cultivation. So here we are talking about hydroponics. It is a method of soil-less cultivation, which is used for growing crops without soil. And it uses basically mineral nutrients solutions, an aqueous solvent. So here you can see here that these plants are grown, different types of plants or crops are grown. And uh, water is supplied through the tubes containing mineral nutrients. Basically, it is a solution of mineral nutrients for growing the plants. And they are in a closed environment here. You can see it is a closed environment. So this is hydroponics. Next one is called aeroponics. Aeroponics is the process of growing plants in an air or mist environment. 
without the use of soil or in any medium. Here you can see that this is a plant supporting system and these plants are hanging here and the roots are hanging in the air actually. And then you have nutrient solutions below here, not in direct touch with these roots. So with the use of electrical control systems and pressure pump, so these nutrient solutions are sprayed onto the roots for the plant to absorb and grow. Besides this, you can have several controls and sensors like temperature sensors, humidity sensors, light intensity sensors, which can be controlled in this closed system. So here you can see the picture of a, a vertical hydroponic commercial farm, where you can see that in different layers, these plants are established in aeroponic system, where as you see in the uh, scheme here, roots will be hanging and then nutrients are sprayed onto the roots, on the hanging roots. So this aeroponic culture differs from both hydroponics, aquaponics, and also in vitro growing. I think you may, may be aware in vitro growing is also called you know, tissue culture plants, where you have a medium in which the plants are grown. Then comes land laser leveling. So what is this? It is a process of smoothening the land surface lesser to lesser minus two centimeters from its average elevation. I think in the beginning I mentioned that it is important to level the land so that the crop grows uniformly and all the management practices, including irrigation, can be done more efficiently. But here we are using a laser-equipped drag buckets to achieve the precision in land leveling. So precision in land leveling involves altering the fields. We alter these fields in such a way as to create a constant slope of 0 to 0.2%, which means, for example, if you have 100 feet length, the variation in the elevation of the slope could be around six inches. So here you can see in this picture, you have a transmitter which transmits laser beam onto the receiver mounted on a tra tractor. And then this receiver will take the signal and this control box will receive this signal from the laser beam and then operation in a hydraulic system. So this hydraulic system, based on the need, it will put into action either a bucket or a scraper. Wherever the elevation is, the slope is more, or some ditches are there, the bucket will operate and then cover it. And wherever the slope is not there, and there are mounds of earth, the scraper is put into action by this control box to remove that. And eventually, you have a leveling. So this is one of the latest agrotechnology that has been developed in the preparation of land. And then you have seed come fertilizer drill. Earlier we have shown that mostly the seeds are sown, the fertilizers are applied manually. But now we have combined seed and fertilizer drills where you have seeds in one box and uh, you have fertilizer in another box and then seeds are sown in rows here and uh, after that you apply fertilizers and they are covered. So the advantage of such machinery is that you sow very accurately with very less labor. Only one driver here and one person assisting him will be operating instead of 10 or 15 people there in the same field. And at the same time, we are able to supply the fertilizer to the plant itself, the seed itself. So next comes the sensors. This is one of the latest developments in the precision agriculture. What is precision agriculture? Precision agriculture is one of the latest agro-technologies 
where the inputs like water, inputs like pesticides, and practices like planting, practices like harvesting, and all other crop management practices are done very precisely so that there is very less wastage and there are high economic returns. And also, there is a good scope to reduce environmental pollution. For example, if you apply fertilizers more precisely, if you apply pesticides more precisely, depending on the requirement of the crop, then you will not have excess of them, these chemicals, released into environment and causing environmental pollution. So here, these sensors, they are used in these precision agricultural systems to import data that helps farmers to monitor and optimize crops and also keep with the changing environmental factors. So environmental factors means that you'll have variable sunshine, variable humidity levels, variable temperatures, variable rainfall events, variable drought events, dry season. So all these are being sensed by these sensors and then they are used by the farmers for monitoring all these aspects of crop management. So along with the sensors, now what we are coming up is IoT smart farming. That is Internet of Things. I think you may be aware what is IoT, where you use the sensors and the computer software and also internet for data sharing. So this is a kind of a physical system which is used in the smart farming. So this particular system of IoT smart farming is built for monitoring the crop yield with the help of sensors like I mentioned earlier, light, humidity, temperature, soil moisture, crop health, etc. And then automate all these crop management practices. For example, you can automate irrigation systems. So now farmers, some farmers are able to monitor field conditions from anywhere through internet and then give uh, command to give irrigation. So the pump will be put on and the irrigation system works. So he need not visit the farm and remotely he can manage his irrigations sitting somewhere. So this is one of the examples where IoT for smart farming works very well. So there are many types of sensors that are used in agriculture. Actually, CSAR labs, laboratories have been working on some of these sensors which are used in agriculture. Your location sensors, where you locate various management spots in the fields, and you have optical sensors where you can see the nutrient deficiencies or the best, best damage to the crop plants, etc. Then you have electrochemical sensors, which can, for example, can determine the soil fertility levels. And then you have mechanical sensors, where you can see the mechanical impedance that is happening in the field, which can be solved through different methods. And then you have dielectric soil moisture sensors, which will monitor the soil moisture levels so depending on the moisture level, the irrigation system can be operated automatically also. And then you have airflow sensors basically used in closed systems because the closed systems, what I have shown you earlier in one of the earlier slides, that the, they require the flow of air. The air sensors will help the optimum flow of air. So these are the various kinds of sensors. Coming to IoT involving sensors on the farm, here we see that you know IoT is used in open farms like this or in the closed farms like this. So they are used for monitoring the crop health. They are used in the crop management, for example, irrigation, fertilizers, and fertilizer application. And at the same time, they are also used in remote management. So these are the various uses 
that IoT involving sensors are used in the new paradigm of agrotechnologies. And then next important development that has taken place recently is vertical farming. Because land is becoming scarce and the demand around urban areas is increasing for many agricultural commodities, especially fruits, vegetables and others. Transportation of vegetables and fruits from a distance place is becoming uneconomical sometimes and uh, unsafe because these vegetables and fruits can be very perishable. So due to all these reasons, this vertical farming has evolved. It is actually a practice of growing crops in vertically stacked layers suitable in urban areas. And in their vertical farming systems, you have controlled environmental agriculture, which aims to optimize plant growth and soilless farming techniques such as hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. So vertical farming is one of the latest agro technologies that is being developed. So here you can see a picture of a commercial vertical farm. So you have various stacks here and the crop plants are grown here and they are managed through either hydroponics or aeroponics. And now these are very commercially viable and new technologies and you get very safe products and it can be established very close to urban centers, cities and towns so that transportation of required agricultural products can be made very easy and economical. The next one is drones. So many of you must be aware of what drones are. Drones are used for several purposes in several fields. They are also used in agriculture. In what areas drones can help the farmers? So they can be used to optimize the use of inputs, for example, seeds, fertilizers, and water. So you can do seeding, you can apply fertilizers, and also you can monitor the water requirement of crops through drones. Second one is that the threats from weeds and pests and diseases caused by fungi and bacteria and others, they can be monitored very quickly and very uh, less reaction time. So either to earlier people used to go to the field and find out a disease or a pest or a weed problem by which time it may be very late to control. Because once the disease develops, it is very difficult to control. So the disease has to be controlled before it becomes virulent. So here we react very fast by using the drone technologies. And then once we apply these inputs, like water, fertilizers, pesticides, etc. So in what way it is performing and how the crop is reacting, it takes a lot of time. So drones, they save time in crop scouting. And then next is, next important area where the drones could be used to improve variable rate prescriptions in real time. Which is, for example, you say, take a field like this. So all the plants in the, all the spots in this field will not be same. There will be differences in terms of their nutrient deficiencies or pests and diseases or weeds. So now the drone technology is used to sense which spots have got which problems and then accordingly you take the remedial measures like applying a herbicide or applying a fertilizer or a pesticide in a specific area, instead of applying to the whole field. For example, you have a disease in one corner of the field. It is not necessary that the whole field should be sprayed with a chemical. You can very precisely control those diseases 
it is almost like something like surgical strike so you strike the disease when it is emerging in some area with the use of drones this is one very important development in this agro technology finally the drones are also used for estimation of yield from the field so when a farmer grows a crop he will be able to estimate using the drone fitted with sensors how much yield that he is going to get and if he is not able to get optimum yield whether he can take up remedial measures to improve the yields so therefore estimation of yields from the fields is an important application of drones in agro technologies next comes satellites in agriculture so we all know that space technology has advanced all over the world and now india is also one of the leaders in space technology in the space technology india has launched along with many other countries many satellites for various purposes but these satellites are also used for agricultural purposes so what are the areas in which the satellites are used in agriculture it can be satellites are used in weather prediction weather prediction meaning when the rains will come when there will be a dry season on the distribution of rainfall across geographical area so all this can be done through satellites then crop health monitoring so from satellites you can monitor the health of the crops how they are growing and then water management how the water is being managed in a macro area uh, to the crops and crop fields fertilizer application can be monitored through satellites biomass map mapping which means that how much greenery or how much vegetation in a particular geographic area which is an indicative indication of the health of the crop that also you can do the mapping and then the satellites can also collaborate with the drones which we have discussed in the earlier slide so both can collaborate and fine tune the kind of management that is given to the crops here i have given you some examples the kind of satellites that in india has been launching for agricultural uses like you have cartography satellite example it is cartosat 1 another type is radar imaging the satellite name is risat 1 and the meteorological forecasting type you have an example kalpana 1 and then meteorological observation you have the insat series so these are the various types of satellites that are used in the various agro technologies worldwide and also in our country now comes the artificial intelligence i am not going to discuss much about artificial intelligence because there is a separate camp for this separate lecture on this but eventually it will culminate in robots in agriculture so robots are used in industrial uses some of you may be aware that industrial manufacture and other applications robots have been used but now robots are also increasingly started being used in agriculture and these robots in agriculture are various types so you have robots like spraying and weeding robots you have crop harvesting robots and then you have seeding and planting robots and you have robots for soil analysis there are soil analysis robots and you have cow milking robots and many others so these are the major examples of various robots that are used in agriculture finally agriculture as a subject is very interesting and is progressing rapidly in the world and also in our country agro technology has several opportunities if somebody wants to take up higher studies somebody wants to do research or teaching and now a lot of agro industries agro tech companies are coming up so a lot of scope in the private industries so youngsters can think of starting their own industries agro tech industries 
or they can be employed in many agrotech companies. So now increasingly, a lot of startup companies are coming in India in the region of agrotech. So I think I have tried to cover very um, uh, widely, but at the same time, briefly, in the sense that I have not discussed each aspect in depth, but I have tried my best to cover what are the various agrotechnologies that are there and that are emerging uh, in our country as well as in the whole world. And CSAR is in the forefront in some of these agrotechnologies. And as students, I'm sure that you will take up agrotechnologies as one of your interesting areas of further studies and career development in future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving uh, an, an elaborate uh, 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 details about the subject and uh, explaining the uh, uh, the ev each and every aspect of agrotechnology, smart agriculture, to, with the students. So I hope the students uh, might have understood things very well, and now uh, they will be like. Uh, 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 willing to ask several questions. So, uh, Dr. Sumit Gairola, I would request Dr. Sumit to please take over the question and answer session. So, there are many questions in the comment section. So, uh, may I request Dr. Sumit to please uh, take, uh, take over and uh, uh, please help the students to get answers to their queries. So, may I request you to please uh, unshare your screen so that... Uh, we can, students can uh, see you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Asha Chauvin. And uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you, uh, Prakasha Rao, sir, for this uh, very informative lecture. And I think uh, after this lecture, many students will be motivated to take up agrotechnology as a subject in future and they'll uh, be an asset to the country in future. So uh, so we have uh, got few questions from the students who are watching this uh, lecture from uh, YouTube. So uh, one question is from Mr. Uh, Manish Pulipaka. So his question is, sir, uh, what is the meaning of agronomy? Although this is a basic question, so sir, would you like to uh, shed some light for his? So agronomy, Hindi way is called Sassi Vijnan. Basically, it is a science of crop production. Agronomy is a science of producing crops. That is what is agronomy. Uh, moving on to next question, and uh, this is from Puli Bharata Bandavi. So, uh, the student has asked, sir, but can we grow different types of crop using hydroponics and aeroponics? And similarly, Yogendra Andy, he has also asked the same question. What are the crops suitable for aeroponics? Many actually hydroponics and aeroponics are majorly used for cultivating many of the vegetables and leafy vegetables and some fruits, like for example, strawberries and others. So not exactly hydroponics and aeroponics are not used for growing crops like rice and wheat, but they are used for cultivation of fruits, vegetables, flowers. Yes, some high value crops are grown there. So uh, now we have another question from Manish Kulapaka. Uh, why is location sensor used? So location sensor is used to locate a, a specific problem. For example, you have a field and then this sensor will locate a particular area which is different from other areas. So it will sense that this particular area is a problem. So I'll give you one example. So you have a field and then there is a rocky outcrop. So which will give a separate signal to the sensor compared to the soil surface. So by this, it will detect and say that, look, this particular area of the uh, field has some rocky problem which has to be managed. Yes, sir. So uh, there is another question from one student. It is regarding that drones are expensive, right? Then how ordinary farmers can use? So, actually, drones, farmers need not purchase actually. So drones can be 
uh, hired. So now many companies are coming forward in India itself. For example, some of the companies, they are now doing custom hiring where, uh, you know, if you want to spray herb uh, pesticide in your farm, they'll charge you some money for that and they'll come and spray the herbicide and then go back. So it will cost you much less. Even small farmers can afford because sometimes in some areas, labor can be in shortage or it can be expensive in some areas. So there they can hire these drones. So individual farmer is not expected to grow, I mean, uh, purchase drones and operate them because it is costly also and technically also it is difficult for the farmer to manage. So custom hiring is one thing that is coming up now. So in that way, drones can be used. So we have so many questions, so I'll take a few more. Uh, like uh, Minu Soni is asking, do we get same nutrients from hydroponics and aeroponics as we get from crops in the field? Yes, you can do that provided you pr prepare the nutrient solution accordingly. It, it is possible. Okay, so uh, one question is from Manish Pulipaka. Sir, how satellites can monitor the crop health? Yes. So now satellites have got a very high resolution. For example, satellite data can give a resolution of even, you know, some satellites can give up to 10 meters uh, resolution. That means in a crop field, up to 10 meters, you can derive the information. So you have, for example, one acre of land. So in that, so there are some few patches of crops or in a particular village, some areas, the crops are healthy, some areas, the crop is not so healthy. The satellite images can reflect that data and then give you an idea that, look, in this area, the crops are okay, but in this area, they are not so okay. So you have to take some remedial measures. Uh, so, sir, I think your presentation has uh, students to think a lot in different directions. So, one question uh, is from Sanjay Manoharan. Is how sunlight is produced in vertical farming? So, no, no, sunlight is not produced. You see, in vertical farming, we use artificial light. I think if you have seen that figure in my slide, there are some sensors: light sensor, humidity sensor, temperature sensor. So in the closed system, we give the artificial light through, you know, uh, bulbs, you know, lights. It is not the sunlight. Uh, so one student, Prabhleen, she is asked, is there any substitute to hybrid seed as they give great harvest, but the seed extract from it cannot give that much harvest? Please repeat it again. I did not understand. Can is there any substitute to hybrid seed? as they give great harvest, but the seed extract from it cannot give that much harvest, probably uh, next generation seeds. Yes, yes. You see, now hybrid seeds are produced for each cycle, you know. So you cannot have the same uh, performance in the next generation. So you have to every time produce the hybrid seeds. Hybrid seed systems are like that. But now the methods are coming where you can sustain, you know, through other genetic means to maintain the the productivity of the crop. Yes, sir. So now we are getting a lot of questions and uh, we are running short of time. So I would uh, request all the students and participants to go through the presentation once again. So that is available on YouTube and uh, most of your questions will be answered there because uh, Dr. Rao has elaborated all these things in his presentation and uh, I hope you'll be able to uh, go through that once again and your questions will be answered. So I uh, thank you, sir, uh, for your presentation and uh, answering these questions. Thank you. So over to Dr. Asha Chaube. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Sumit, for uh, helping the students to get answers to their queries. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, for answering the questions of the students. And I hope if they have more questions, we can approach you to help them uh, to get their queries answered. Sure. So, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for uh, and for uh, to be part of this program and helping us to arrange this boot camp for these students. I hope these students might have uh, got the experience of uh, uh, agro technology through the lecture, and uh, they will be able to answer the. 
questions to the quiz. So uh, may I now uh, request uh, uh, Shagaf to kindly uh, go to Mentimeter and I request all the students to please go to Mentimeter. Uh, and uh, so here a uh, passcode is uh, being displayed. So kindly, uh, Kindly go to Mentimeter and enter the passcode 2147840 so that we can start the quiz. So I once again uh, request all the students to please to please Yeah, please. So keep entering into the quiz. I know you guys were waiting for the quiz for so long. You were, many of you were writing in the com uh, comment section when quiz is going to start. So this is the time, please. Please log in to uh, menti.com and enter the passcode so that you can enter the quiz. So once the number is stabilized, we can start the uh, quiz. Shagaf, I hope you can see how many students have entered the quiz. Yeah, total 31 have entered. Yeah. So let's wait. Sir, I think uh, you know five minutes, sir, I think to join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we are waiting. We are waiting. Until the number stabilizes, we'll wait. So please type menti.com in your browser and then you can type in the passcode. Please write menti.com in your browser. It will ask for the passcode. So passcode is being displayed on the screen. Please enter the passcode. So code is 2147840. You can type in menti.com in your browser and then enter the passcode. So Harish, your queries will be answered afterwards. We are entering into uh, the uh, quiz right now. Kindly do fast because we have another section after this session. So we'll start the quiz once uh, the, uh, the number stabilizes. So please write menti.com in your browser and then enter the passcode when it prompts you to enter the passcode. Uh, so we have got 87 entries till now, 90 now. Yeah. 
yeah still it is increasing we'll wait okay. for one more minute and then yes. we can start yes Oh, 100. So it is still increasing. Let's see. 